Well, good morning, First Baptist Church members and guests who are joining us on Passion Radio and Facebook and social media and all from around Gallup, New Mexico, the United States, and the world. We're glad that you are here with us this morning, and we pray that you've had a blessed week, that God has blessed you as he's blessed us. Let's This morning, we want to invite you to stand wherever you are in your home or wherever you might be with your family members to stand and sing as we're going to start uh, our praise to our Lord this morning who is worthy. Sing out, sing loud as we're going to join with uh, the, pe- the angels of heaven and everyone already singing. We're just going to join those choruses this morning as we sing all hail the power of Jesus name. pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we do crown you Lord of all because, Lord, we know that you are the true King, the King of all, the one that we worship and we adore. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity this morning, Lord, and the opportunities we've had in past weeks, despite what's going on in our country and in our world, we can still come and worship you. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would, we would worship, as the Bible says, in spirit and in truth this morning. Lord, be with Pastor Jay as he comes to deliver the message that you've laid upon his heart. Lord, the message that we all desperately need to hear this morning. Speak through him. Let your Holy Spirit flow through him. Lord, as we continue in our praise this morning, we pray that all of the things, all of the distractions that we've had during the week, that those things would pass away. And we would just focus on you this morning. Lord, whatever may be holding us back in our life, whatever sin may be present in our life, Lord, help us to lay it down this morning so that we can get rid of that and start fresh, start the week fresh. And we thank you that we can start our week by worshiping you, by coming into your presence and hearing from your word and and wiping the slate clean, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us and what you're going to do for us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. And remain standing wherever you're at, and we're going to crown him with many crowns.
And let's sing the song we learned last week. Let his kingdom come. Let his will be done. Let that be your prayer as you sing this this morning. Worthy is 
the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. We sing a new song to Him who sits on.
Amen. You may be seated where you are this morning, and at this time I'd like to welcome Pastor Jay McCollum to bring us a message from the Lord this morning. Thank you, thank you. And we're glad that you have chosen to uh, join us on social media, um, watching and viewing this service live from First Baptist Church in Gallup, New Mexico. It is our 100th year, and we'll be celebrating that during the month of July, and hopefully we'll be back to more uh, live worship in our auditorium, and we want to invite you to join us on Sundays when this um, stay-at-home order has been relieved and we can begin to go about our daily activities. We certainly want to congratulate all the graduating high school seniors, class of 2020. Many of them have lost a great deal of time uh, from the classroom and some of the social activities they enjoy doing, and uh, we look forward to celebrating them and the members of our church who will be graduating from high school this year and taking off doing different things in their career choices. We also want to thank those who are assisting us. Uh, Nathan White, if you have listened to him, uh, praise the Lord through song, is relatively a new staff member here. He joined us in February of 2020, and he has an amazing ability to lead worship as God has called him to do this. He was a graduate of Sandia High School, then went to the University of Denver, where he learned uh, not only earned a degree in um, music, but also performing degrees and masters as a trained opera singer. He plays over 30 instruments, and we are being blessed to have a man of his caliber here in Gallup, New Mexico, along with his wife, Haley, and their daughter, Naomi, has joined our staff and our community and live here in the Gallup community. And so we're very glad to have them here, and you want to continue to listen each Sunday and by radio. We're grateful that you're listening by radio this morning. My friend Sammy Kyoto has helped us greatly in Millennia Media and all the staff there to have not only their KYVA AM uh, 1230 and as well as the FM station 98.3. And then Passion Radio Network out of the farming community have broadcasting this over the Four Corners region. There's over 40 translators carrying this message this morning, and we're very grateful for their help in doing so. There's another per group of people I want to thank. There are people who have been watching this radio broadcast, this live uh, social media broadcast each Sunday morning, who have been mailing checks into our church. And we want to thank you for that opportunity to not only give uh, online, but some have mailed checks. And one of the things that we do is that we have a basket of offering, and we bring it into our auditorium, and we pray over that offering each Sunday like we would normally do. And that money is being placed in the bank. And if you'd like to give, you can get on our website. You can follow the steps to online giving, or you can mail a check to First Baptist Church located at 2112 College Drive. That is our mailing address, 2112 College Drive, Gallup, New Mexico, 87301. You can mail your checks in. And we're grateful for those who are not members, but I'm also appealing to the membership of our church to be sure to be faithful in worship and giving your tithes and offerings on a consistent basis. You can set up online giving, giving by an ACH account using your checking account, or you can go online on a weekly basis and you can give accordingly as God live, gives you that opportunity to do so. Now, I'd like for you to take your Bibles. I am a biblical preacher. I have nothing else to say except what God has given us through His Holy Word. And if you have your Bibles, I, you might want to go and get it. Open up to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And I'll be focusing on the 8th chapter not only uh, this Sunday, but uh, it is an amazing chapter in the writing of Paul to the church at Rome. The title of my message today is The Christian Ultimate Triumph. And the passage you'll be reading this morning is out of the 8th chapter, verses 9, 18 and 19. And you may want to follow along as I read. And I want to challenge you during this week to read verses 1 through 30. Maybe after the message here this morning that you begin this process of just reading through the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 18 and 19. 
I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Creation awaits in eager expectation for the sons of God to re be revealed. If you would join with me as we pray together, maybe right there in the family room or the great room of your house or maybe on the back porch, possibly you are in a uh, place that is private, maybe your own personal bedroom. But God has been speaking to you this entire week. He's impressed upon you to join us through Facebook and other social media outlets. And it is time for us just to bow our heads. I'd ask that you do so and join with me as we pray. Holy Heavenly Father, you have made us, redeemed us, and sealed us. We are yours. We believe that you will work all things together for good for those who love you. Help us to bear your chastening. Grant that through the test and suffering of this present pilgrimage, we may grow in our faith and be become more like you. Give us the faith to believe even when we don't see your purposes for us that are good. And that the end will be unto your glory. We all ask that you would comfort families of those who have lost loved ones to death. Those who are going through a difficult struggles and emotional torment. And we all ask these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us in prayer. In your personal time of praying, I certainly would ask that you would remember those who are caregivers. I'm speaking of doctors and nurses and hospital staff and maintenance personnel who uh, diligently work to try to uh, bring the end to human suffering, often because of this COVID-19 virus. And I'd ask that you be praying to them. And those who provide security in our communities. And those who are seeking the cure through research uh, to find a cure or an inoculation against this disease known as COVID-19, the coronavirus. Many of you may not know this, but I grew up in a place in a country known as Hurricane Country. And that's what we called it, it's the Hurricanes, which are normally... Uh, found along the Gulf Coast of the southeast Texas area and along the entire Gulf Coast from the tip of Florida all the way to the tip of Texas and then in, of course, the country of Mexico. And it is from late August to mid-September, uh, everyone that I know, and you'll go to some people's homes and they'll actually have a magnet map on the wall, most of the time in their kitchen, where they will have uh, a magnet of a hurricane, and then they will plot the latitude and longitude points. They'll all listen to weather reports coming out of the Gulf of Mexico and north of the equator to see if any hurricane activity is approaching the coastline. In the northern hemisphere, hurricane winds blow around the eye counterclockwise direction. It is to be considered a hurricane when wind speeds are over 74 miles an hour. A measure as large as two to 300 miles in diameter. Hurricane winds swirl around the eye. And what is amazing about a hurricane is that the calm area is actually in the center of the storm. The eye of a hurricane measures from 20 to 25 miles in diameter, and it is a calm area. No wind blows. If you're in the middle of a storm like a hurricane and in the center of the eye, you can literally look up and see the stars at night, or you can see clear blue skies. 
You can even see the sun shining. The storm clouds call warm wall clouds surround the eye and the strongest winds and the heaviest rain of a hurricane occur within these wall clouds. The east side of the hurricane is the most dangerous. The outer winds are called squalls and it sounds like screams when a person is in the middle of a hurricane. But again, that amazing thing of a hurricane is the eye of the storm. No wind, clear skies, no rain, literally peace from the storm. And if I could speak to all of us, including myself, because I can honestly tell you this last week has been the most difficult that I've had during this COVID-19 virus process. It's been a very difficult week for me. And I too have to seek the Lord and always trust Him as I encourage you to trust Him. In Psalm 122, 7 it says, May there be peace within your walls, security within your citadels. Technically, uh, the psalmist David is writing this particular psalm referring to the fact that we want peace within. And that's what we need today. Peace in our minds and our hearts in the middle of the storm. Because all of us have storms in our lives. Emotional storms, physical storms, struggles with the Spirit of God and the battle that we have giving our lives to Him or as we know Him, the evil one attacks us. Jesus said, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Even in the Scriptures, when you go through the Old and New Testament, it is amazing how many times God tells us not to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of death and dying. We don't have to be afraid of life and living. We don't have to be afraid of what tomorrow may bring for any of us. He tells us that he wants us to have peace. And that's what he wants. And today, I want to focus to those of you who have given your life to Christ. I want to focus to you that maybe you have accepted Christ during this crisis as we have known as COVID-19 or the virus that seems to be attacking so many. And I want to encourage all of you to listen to the medical advice they're receiving from our counties and our cities and our nation and listen to what they're saying. This is a deadly virus. It can bring death at a moment's notice to anybody's age group. But in Romans, the 8th chapter is called the inspirational highlight of the book of Romans. The theme of this passage and the theme of this chapter is living by the Spirit. Literally, 21 times in Romans 8, the Greek word for spirit occurs. Over 18 times, it is reference to the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. The Spirit of God literally speaking to us as an individual, a person. It also means for us who have accepted Jesus Christ, that we have a new life in their spirit, referring to the fact that the Spirit of God lives within us. The passage that I read last Sunday, and we'll read again there, this passage, beginning in the very first verse of chapter Romans, and if you'll look along, and you may want to highlight this passage as I have in my Bible, Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life and has set us free from the law of sin and death. Literally, he has taken the bondage of sin away from us. And in the construction of this particular passage, no condemnation, meaning nothing in the past, nothing in this present hour, and nothing into the future will ever keep us from the love of God and the presence of God. 
and eternal life that He promises. When by acceptance and faith we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, God does some wonderful things for us. And there's th six things that I want to focus on this morning that you want to make note of today. Six things. We are justified. This is the first one. God counts us righteous. In Romans, the third chapter, verses 23 through 28, we realize that the penalty of sin is completely removed forever. God delivers us, redeems us, and He takes that sin mark, the sin nature that we have in our life that causes us to do the multiple sins. He says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has made us unique, renewed, forgiven. He has given us new life. And that the law of the Spirit gives eternal life to those who believe in Jesus has overcome the old law, which is the wages of sin. And the Scripture says it's death, according to Romans, the 6th chapter, and verse 23. In Romans, the 8th chapter, as I read, verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. We have been taken, and the burden of this has been lifted, and we're new in Christ. In this process, God challenges us as believers, followers of God, that we have peace with God, and we are exhorted, encouraged, empowered to enjoy it. Therefore, we have been justified through faith and have the peace of God, with God, through God, in our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we have gained access by faith into His grace by which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 2. What an amazing peace that God gives us. Has peace in our hearts because the presence of God, His Spirit lives within us. Even in our darkest moments of our lives, even when we don't even feel like God is even in the room and our prayers are not even going beyond the roof, God understands and knows us. He has created us in His image. He has given us new life. He has given us purpose and direction in our life. He tells us that we are regenerated. We're made into new people, a new person in Christ. It doesn't necessarily mean that though there are those who wish they could change their hair color during this crisis that we're in, or some are finding, going to find someone who can, but we are made new from the inside out. Passage I read last week out of 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17. All things pass away, and all things become new. We are the children of God. See, we're justified. We are basically at peace with God. We're regenerated into new people. But what does that mean? It means that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit of God is now residing in us to give us guidance and help. We're born again. We're saved. We redeemed people. That's what the Bible calls us. We sing about it in our faith journey. One of my favorite songs, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. A child forever I am. That's the kind of spirit God puts within us. The purpose is to let the Holy Spirit have control. They who do not walk after the flesh, that is, do not willfully follow the desires of an unregenerate nature. They now walk after the Spirit because of the new creature, because of the newness that God gives us, because of the fact that we are the children of God. We desire the things of God. We want to know Him. We want to understand His Word and apply it to our life. 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, beginning verse 9, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and Corinth was such a hideous place in the ancient world. 
there were those around the world who would go to Corinth, and the concept would be to go to Corinthianize or to live as the people of Corinth. Listen to what Paul says. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be the slave, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God? Now listen to the promise as a child of God. And that's what some of you were. You were washed. You were sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. That's what happens when a person comes into the understanding of God. For if you live by the sinful nature, you will die. But by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. God gives us a promise. And see, too often Christian people live in the horrors of their past. I can never be what God wants me to be because I've done a certain deed or I've involved myself in certain activities or I've gone the wrong way in our life. But when the forgiveness of God comes in our life, remember there are no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in the past. I even messed up today, preacher, our last night. But God will forgive and restore our life because he wants us to have eternal life. Before salvation, we were carnally minded, and the end was death. Now that we're born again, now that we are redeemed, now that we are saved, we have a new life in Christ, and we're spiritually minded, and the end is life and peace. Those of you who have your Bibles in the chapter 8, which I have my Bible, you look with me in your Bible, in Romans the 8th chapter, verse 6 and 7. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace because the sinful mind is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. See, those who are controlled by the sinful nature in the flesh cannot please God according to Romans, the 8th chapter and verse 8. See, good works is what many people do. Here's the argument that I've discovered being a preacher. This year, this month, I've discovered this. Well, if I can do just enough good stuff to balance out all my bad stuff, I know God loves me and he has a place in heaven for me. That is wrong thinking. No matter how many good things unsaved people may do, they cannot please God. And that's why we see in the law of profession these scales. They're scales that here's the standard that we live by and here's what we've done. And I know that I've messed up a lot of my life and I'm going to try to do some good things so I can outweigh what things been over here. And we have are constantly in a battle trying to balance out good and evil. A wise man said, and I want you to listen to this. Nothing is right unless the heart is right. We have to change the heart of a human being. And we can't do it. God can do it. God promises in the most wonderful day way that the redeemed people have eternal life and that having come out under the condemnation, they never will return to condemnation. God says, and he promises here in the 8th chapter, there are no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The word really means disapproval or the act of punishment or sentencing. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. 
And that's in John, the fifth chapter, and verse 24. This is Jesus' solemn promise. My sheep. Now, that's a good word. We are referred to as sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. John, the 10th chapter, and verse 27 and 28. Here is the amazing promise, and it's why I believe that a person can never lose their salvation. When we submit our life to Christ, when we humble ourselves and seek the forgiveness of God, and we invite him to come into our life, he comes into our life, and he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He is our God from that point on. And we, who are followers of Christ, can understand this promise because we hear the voice of God speak in our spiritual ears. We know for a fact that we're born again, and we know that God has a plan and a purpose for us. Even in this difficult hour we live in, God is still a merciful, loving, and caring God. My sheep hear their voice. Now, many of you in this geographical region, and some of you who are listening at another place in the world, uh, people in this geographical e region of the world do own sheep. Many of them have their own little pet lambs and ewes. And the amazing thing about sheep is that they have an eye that is close to the human eye, and even medical research use sheep eyes to do research. They also have a keen sense of hearing and will hear the voice of their master. I grew up in cattle country. My family were cattle people, and they hear the voice of the one certainly who feeds them. And they will come when the owner of the cattle, cattlemen will call, and they will come because they're going to be fed. The amazing thing about it is, even when cattle hear a strange voice, they stand away at a distance, and they will look. The born-again Christian hears the voice of God. Even when there had been sin in their life that has ruined the fellowship in a relationship with God, God wants to restore them. They hear his voice. They respond to his call. They return. Because you see, in this process, we realize that God wants to give us eternal life wants to restore relationships, and we're sealed by His Spirit. Sixth thing, sealed by His Spirit. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us. He has set His seal of ownership on us. He has put His Spirit in our heart as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 23 and 24. In ancient days, documents were rolled up. They were sealed in wax. But before they were sealed in wax, the document had to be a, 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 had been assigned a seal. Wax would be dropped, a signet ring would be planted, and a signature of the king made it a, an official document. We have the same sort of thing today when we have uh, a notary public uh, guarantee a signature. You'll find that to be true when earnest money is a down payment to ensure a fulfillment of a contract. We do that when we buy a house. We'll put up earnest money, meaning our intent is real and that we plan to buy a house. God puts his spirit within us. His spirit is a down payment. It is a seal that gives us Hope, knowing that God has a place eternal in the heavens for us as individuals. I'll assure you that God has given us his stamp of approval. God has given us his seal. God has given us his earnest money by sending his son who died on a cross, who basically paid a sin debt that we could not pay by the shedding of his blood. That is who we are in Christ. But I'll assure you, 
every Christian is in a battle. One would expect that a saved person for whom the Lord has done so much would be released from all suffering, would be free from the battle with sin. I can say this without, with confidence today. If I could eliminate all your problems, if I could heal you from any disease, if I could overcome this COVID-19 virus, I could convert the world in 24 hours. But I'm not God. Neither are you. And quit blaming God for all the problems in your life. Some of the problems in your life have been brought on by yourself. And you need to be redeemed from it. You need to have a new plan for your life. Here's what a lady, a dear Christian friend, asked many to join in in praying that we would humble ourselves before the Lord. You want to blame God. But let's look at some things. We all need to cry out to God and ask His forgiveness for our own sins, our own apathy, being lukewarm. And I'm speaking to the people of First Baptist Church of Gallup, New Mexico, who are listening to this at home. Some of them hadn't darkened the door of this church this year, and they're home listening, praise God. Some of them still haven't listened. But maybe you have not been in church this year. Or maybe you have grown lukewarm. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, we are warned that God would rather have us hot or cold, not lukewarm. We need to ask God for forgiveness of our sins, our apathy, our being lukewarm, false religions, sins of our churches, sins of our land, sins of our government, including abortion sex trafficking, homosexuality, greed, pornography, gambling. It's going to be amazing to me when we get through all this thing how much money people got now since they quit gambling so much of it. Drunkenness, drug addiction, and evil of all sorts. We have people who practice witchcraft and look to the moon and the stars for guidance in their lives when they need to turn to the God. We need to pray, read His Word, and get our hearts lined up with the Lord and the Creator of this universe. Look and listen to what Jesus said. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, take heart. I have overcome the world. John 16. Pardon me. John 8, 15, 16, and 17. The battle with sin may be even intensified after you become a Christian. A Christian man or woman purposes to do the will of God, but Satan always tries to trip he or she up. See, what does Paul say about this in Galatians? He wrote in the 6th chapter, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself. You may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. In this way will fulfill the law of Christ. See, the difference between an unsaved, an unforgiven, a non-person that's not been born again, who deliberately sins, and a Christian who's who sins slips into a, into a different as death in, death in life. For you see, it is difficult to get both a saved person to see the distinction is almost to get an unsaved person to see it as well. John makes it very clear for us. Here's the distinction in John, 1 John, the first chapter, where he is writing about the fellowship of believers. With the Father through Jesus Christ. Fellowship means to share, to partnership with, to in participation. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, and in the tense of this means to continue to walk in that way of life, we lie. We do not live by faith, but walk in the light. As He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ, His Son, purifies us 
from every sin. This is in 1 John verse chapter, verse 6 through 7. He says, but if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's 1 John 1, 8. But 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. No person who follows sin willfully is saved. No saved person as as good as Jesus Christ. See, too often we start pointing fingers at one another. Unsaved people look at people at church and say, I don't want to go down there with them hypocrites. Well, we're all hypocrites. You're just as much a hypocrite as anybody else. But Paul said it so clearly for all of us. In Philippians, the third chapter, verses 12, 13, and 14. Not that I have already obtained all this. I have already been made perfect, but I press to take hold of what Christ took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself taking hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul, who said he was the chief of sinners, Paul, who even had Christians killed, is using a word picture of straining like a runner, a sprinter, reaching with his chest or her chest out to cross the tape first to win the race. The test of a Christian is not they live without sin, but they are sincerely purposed to do so. But when they discover they have sinned, they confess and ask for forgiveness. And that's what we all need to do. Every day, every week, every month, every year of our life, we ask God to forgive us, to give us a new life, to allow us to live in the power of the Spirit of God that lives within us because we are the sons and daughters of God. The union and fellowship with Christ is so strong that no person or thing can break it. Hebrews 12, chapter and verse 7, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? To make I make a sad, make a note here. One of the tragedies I see in our present generation that too many children, sons and daughters, growing up without a male figure in the home. One of the things we need to ask God for is to restore the family in America and in the world. Because one of the three things that God ordains, it is the family the church, and government. And those things need to be renewed in our time. And we want God's blessing in our life. We need to seek God's forgiveness and allow Him to restore families, restore the church, and restore government to its rightful place. And quit looking for the government to for be just all the handouts. We have government to allow us to live in peace. And God wants to use it that way. Christ deals with believers as a loving Father deals with His children. And when children do wrong, they do not cease being their father's children. But I'll assure you that relationship is fragile. Maybe in your own families you need to work to restore relationships with sons and daughters. Parents, the Heavenly Father loves His children too much to see that they go on doing what they've been doing without doing something about it. What does God do? He convicts us of sin. And maybe you're under conviction right now, and you're just mad at the preacher, mad at the church, mad at your mom, mad at your dad. And he chastises his children. But then he restores his children. The Heavenly Father wants his children to grow in grace and knowledge. He desires for them to be produced the fruits of righteousness and do good works that glorify God. The Holy Spirit is present in believers to assist them in this process. As a growing Christian, we must realize that salvation is a past project, it is a present project, and it is a future project. In our conversion, 
we are justified, regenerated, and adopted as God's children. And he gives us eternal life and sanctified in the primary sense that God has sealed us as his own possession. You and I know something about buying things. We go to a store. We go into a website. We order something online. We produce a number, a credit card. We produce cash. We write a check. We purchase something. It becomes our possession. When Jesus died on a cross, he shed his arms out. It was nailed. His feet was nailed to a cross. His blood was shed. At the shedding of his blood, he bought us. He bought us as a gift for himself. We are blood bought at Calvary's cross. We become the child of God. That is the promise he gives those who give them their lives. Since conversion, salvation has been this continuous process of sanctification. Dear friends, now that we are children of God and what we have has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. I want you to bow your head with me in prayer now. Just simply ask God to forgive you and restore your life. God, I need your forgiveness. As a believer, I trusted you many years ago. And I have failed. And I ask you to restore my life. For those who need to ask Jesus to come in, you can ask him to come into your life now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Continue the spirit of prayer as Nathan leads us in this time of benediction as well as invitation. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and thou that bidst me come to
thank all of you who joined us this morning here on Facebook and social media. We pray that this message was convicting and also encouraging to you this morning. We pray that you have a blessed week and know that all of us here at First Baptist Church are going to be praying for you this week as uh, you go about and we just uh, pray for you uh, to know and ask that you would know that the Lord is with you and that we will be Again, keeping you in prayer this week. Have a blessed week.